Devin, when you're when you're doing this, do you close all your Zoom tabs and just to make it simple, that kind of thing? All my like Chrome tabs or Zoom tabs? I'm sorry, Chrome tabs. Yeah. Um, I <laughs> I have kind of like a funky setup, so I put I usually don't use my laptop unless I'm facilitating and I do the screen with the camera as my like Zoom home page. Um, and then I have the slide deck always to my left because I'm not like as inclined to look to that. So that's where I'm sharing. And then on the one right behind the laptop, I have the agenda and then any speaker notes I might have. Oh, okay. Yeah. And then when you're switching from this to let's just say a Jamboard. Do you do you have a separate browser window open? Already? Yeah. So right now I have the agenda, the Jamboard, a uh, handout for breakout one, the leadership styles Padlet, and a handout for breakout room oh, wow. two all pulled up, ready to go. Yeah. Could you, could you would you mind sending me a picture sometime? Yeah. Like, just so I could see. <laughs> I, I want to try to get organized because. I, last summer, I remember what I might have told you, but one of the internship internship um, workshops that I gave, I was just it was I was just not organized about it in that regard, and and people somebody actually wrote about it in the posts or you know. <laughs> <laughs> like take it to heart forever. No, yeah, well I don't, but I, I I took it seriously anyway. I mean, they said they just said it seems like the technical side should be better at this point. <laughs> I was like, yeah, you're probably right. <laughs> Three years in. <laughs> Thanks for that feedback. <laughs> I, yeah. It takes a lot of practice. It's funny now, when I, you know, when I first started facilitating virtually, it was really uncomfortable and felt super awkward. And now when I do it in real life, I'm like, oh, like, how do I get people to break up? <laughs> Yeah. Like I'm gonna yeah. send you to your breakout rooms. Never mind. <laughs> Count off. <laughs> you know, or like <laughs> it's That's just funny. It's funny. Yeah. Yeah. I know we're doing this in person next week. And um yeah, it's that's gonna be one of my one of my first in-person events, especially it's I think it's the first long one, extended one. But I think you know it'll be good because. It, it is long and that way we get to know each other and all of that but it, it is different yeah so you have four you have do you have like your laptop and then three monitors up just just two monitors yeah <coughs> at home I just have one oh. because uh, <laughs> my husband got a full-time job but he's working for a university so he doesn't have any like auxiliary stuff. And that were, those were things that we bought when I first started oh, yeah. working remote. So he, he talked me out of one of the monitors, oh, which good. I suppose is allowed. <laughs> that's funny. I know. That's understandable. Yeah. How, how selfless of me. <laughs> Hi, hey, Chris. Chris. Morning. Morning. Um, Chris, do you think, are there, um, well, can you think of things that maybe we might want to say at the end or the beginning that are sort of housekeeping kinds of things? Like one thing that I realized is that, excuse me, we have to send this, these people the agenda with the details and also that they, we have not yet told them that we're starting at 845 and not nine o'clock. And so um, I think um, what else, what I, what I was thinking is, is, is to say it today, to say that today, and then say, if that's a problem for you, just email us or email me. And so we can figure something out, something like that. I always yeah. remind people with the Mesa lab too, it takes 20 minutes to walk from <laughs> the parking lot to <laughs> whatever yeah. meeting room. So if you get there at 840, you're going to be. 15 minutes late. That's right. I love that 20 minutes. It is definitely longer than like three or four minutes. Yeah. Yeah, Val, I think that's a good um 
the, the reminder and then sending out because there's the pre-reading and then there's the uh, agenda and they should both be sent. I mean, uh, since um, Adriana sent the pre-reading, I think. Yeah. Can we get all that stuff out today so they've got yeah. time to look at it? Yeah. Although the agenda, we have to just I have to just make it look a little like, you know, not include everything, but that won't take long. OK. Yeah. yeah. If that can go out, uh, you know. Yeah, Sometime today early. after the session. Yeah, you're right, exactly. That would be great. And then maybe just make sure those who have travel, they have to, you know, that their travel is all set, that they take. Yeah, care. I actually emailed them yesterday. Oh, okay, great. Um, I only heard back from one, but then um, did I tell you, I don't remember if I shared this, but one person got called is has been selected yes. for jury duty what a drag no what a drag ah uh, no. and she so she she thinks she it may go into next week it's like talk about bad timing for her yeah we'll see we'll just see we'll hope hope for the best hope yeah it gets resolved good morning everybody i think the only time people are actually selected for jury duty is when like they literally do not have the time for it you know like there's no way to make <laughs> but otherwise they're like no we yeah. don't need you this time and they actually don't want to do it yeah. <laughs> they have something they want to do Just give folks a few more minutes to join. Yeah. Guess it's not even nine yet. I'm just I'm just eager and excited to be here this morning. <laughs> Had lots yeah, of coffee. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I went I went out with my dog um, today. I tried it out for the first time. This hyper dog of ours um, on a leash, but riding my bike so that it mm -hmm. could actually give him more exercise. Her more exercise. And she did great. That's good. Probably <laughs> happy to be able to run. <laughs> My younger brother is in his residency um, for medical school, or I guess he's a doctor now, so he's not in school anymore. But him and his fiance is also her first year in residency. And they got this high, high, high energy retriever mix. And oh. it is the worst behaved I haven't met the dog but it, it'll be like up on the dining table and they're taking pictures and I'm like what wow well, yeah <laughs> oh but, yeah tell them to get a trainer because I, I waited too long with with this dog and I did find one and she's really good but I wish we'd started yet earlier like younger age <laughs> yeah you kind of have to do it well when they still don't really haven't gone through the ranking phase or anything yet yeah, yeah. Welcome, folks. Happy Tuesday. Just give it until maybe one or two after the hour. Great. Yeah, we're still missing quite a few. And if you are here and have the capacity to turn on your camera, I'd love to see your smiling faces or coffee deprived faces this morning. No judgment either direction. <laughs> maybe both. <laughs> oh, look at that. Yay. I want to try to get to know people's names too. The ones I don't know. It is helpful. You know, it's been kind of strange in this transitionary period meeting people in real life for the first time. I'm like, whoa, you're taller than I expected. Or like, <laughs> I didn't know you had a side profile. <laughs> or where's your name tag? 
<laughs> like, oh, I know that face really well. <laughs> yeah. We are going to have name tags, the handwritten ones next week. So probably should use those the first couple of days until we really know, know each other's names. Yep, it's funny. And if anybody has questions about next week, feel free to ask or email or put it in the chat. We will be sending you um, a more detailed agenda uh, later today. And so that will give you more of an idea of what, what we're doing and what, where it'll all be. All of it will be in the Mesa lab. And as um, Devin pointed out a few minutes ago, that uh, just a heads up, it takes a good 20 minutes to walk from your car up to the basal lab. <laughs> That's an exaggeration, but it does take time. It's, it's a bit of a haul. And so um, just build that into your, your schedule. Okay, if it's okay with you and Chris, um, Val, let's go ahead and get started and we'll get folks caught up as they come in, but we do have quite a bit to cover today. Um, and I know I met most of you last week in your orientation, but if you've forgotten or if we for some reason haven't met yet, my name is Devin Duncan and I'm the Talent and Learning Development Lead within um, UCAR's HR. And uh, today we're going to be talking about the fundamentals of leadership. What is leadership? How do we define it? And so Think of this as kind of a 30,000 foot view of leadership and different components of this you'll learn more about throughout the program, but we're looking at this from a really broad perspective today. Um, and so my learning objectives for you all are first to explore the qualities of great leaders and next to understand the different types of power and leadership. Um, and so what we're going to cover is what does uh, great leadership look like, some myths and realities of leadership, reflections on leadership skills in science specifically, and then different types of um, power and leadership, which um, I'm really looking forward to. And I would love to hear a hey, hello, if you want to come off mute for a second and say good morning to your fellow learners. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. It's nice to morning. hear people's people's voices. Okay, so where we're going to start today is um, thinking about. When you consider a leader that you admire, and this could be someone within the organization, it could be someone, you know, a professor or a political leader or a social movement leader, or however you want to consider that, um, what qualities do they possess and what do they do? And I'm actually going to ask you all to share your responses on this Jamboard. And Monica, I will be sharing a PDF of this, as well as our responses. We're doing a couple different Jamboard type activities. Um, and I'm gonna double check everyone can, let me reshare my screen as well. Um, so I'm gonna ask you to answer the, these two questions. So when you think about the leader you admire, what qualities do they possess and what do they do? So the qualities and traits would be in this darker blue, section and the behaviors and actions would be in this kind of teal section. And you can just add sticky notes. And okay, great, people are familiar. Um, and there are a few pages. So if, if one of the pages gets filled up, don't feel like we need to cram all of them into one. Um, I would love to uh, play some music if folks are okay with that. But if you are not if you can't focus with music playing, would you send me a quick message? No, no problem at all. And we'll do this for about 10 minutes.
So I'm curious, when you're looking through your colleagues' responses, do you notice any themes? I think there's a lot of like emotion um, and perhaps like, like how they're in control of those emotions. Totally. Emotional intelligence is an important aspect of leadership. What else? I think that a lot of it has to do with um, rather than being like overtly dominant, um in any given situation and demonstrating leadership and that kind of maybe more um like somewhat maybe what can be construed as aggressive fashion showing leadership through receptivity um and things like modesty and active leading and kind of that like implicit like helping a team to go towards their aims and goals does that make sense? Totally. It's like you're reading ahead in my presentation. Um, after our break today, we're going to go into uh, more detail about different leadership styles because there isn't a one-size-fits-all approach to leadership. When looking through this, how many of these qualities, traits, behaviors, and actions are um, a scientific skill set or a technical skill set. None. <laughs> I'm reading the chat. That wasn't that came off as <laughs> <laughs> not many. Right. Yeah. I think some of these we could align with science, but it's it's more related to the collaborative side of science, right, where we're already working with other folks. Um, I just point that out because I think it's interesting to consider um, what how we approach leadership. And a lot of times we're put into leadership roles because we're really excellent at our given discipline. And it takes just as much effort to learn about you know, interacting with others and motivating teams and leading with kindness and kind of all these, what we, some people call soft skills. I prefer people skills because they're actually pretty hard. Um, they're just not hard science, right? Any thoughts about that observation or disagreements? I have one question. Sure, Val. When, from what you know, when you see leaders who, let's say, have are strong in these qualities, but maybe don't have as much expertise as the people they're supervising, um, and yet, and there's a kind of an issue of like respect that can happen where people, the people who are more technically skilled, maybe don't respect the the leader as much. But um, do you think that it can work out? pretty well anyway. You know, I think it, a lot of leadership is situational. Um, and so if the team is struggling to respect someone who doesn't have the same technical background, as a leader, I think that would be their responsibility to figure out what knowledge am I missing and how can I still demonstrate my effectiveness? And that could be as a support role, that could be helping with project management. Um, but I think the there's not necessarily like a sweeping answer to that. And Chris, I see your hand up. And Carlos, I also saw that you unmuted. Oh. I didn't know if you had anything to share. Well, I was thinking about what something to say, but you were saying, you know, something pretty similar. Um, I see a leader as a, uh, you know, my perspective is a leader doesn't have to know everything his team knows. A leader should be able to coordinate and ident to me and identify, um, you know, his team's um, forces, and then kind of coordinate those teams. Um, however, I do, I can see how, like, you know, your team might not have the respect for you if you don't have the understanding or the capacity to 
do what they do. But as how I see it is the leader should allow their team to do what they do best. Um, therefore, he cannot be the best at everything, you know, they do. Yep, your your team can't be, there, there's a quote that's like, uh, you can't be everything all at once or something, but your team can. You can't be perfectly well-rounded, but your team can. I think that's what it is. Chris? Devin, I think I wanted to add a, a little slightly different perspective here. I mean, I think in this exercise, we're talking about generic aspects of leadership, but in any particular situation, subject knowledge, I think, is important to a point. Uh, for instance, uh, I don't think I would be that effective to lead a team of software engineers in developing a large software engineering, engineering project just because that's not my background. And I, th and I think, you know, we, we do need to recognize that some amount of, of that expertise is very helpful in guiding where the team is going. But like you said, it doesn't have to be all encompassing. You don't have to know everything that everybody knows. But I do think it's really helpful. So I, in it's situation dependent. Thanks, Chris. Um, and then one assumption that I'm making in today's session is that leadership can exist at all levels of the organization. So we're not just looking at formal leadership where, you know, I'm serving as a supervisor or I'm the project lead or I'm the project manager. We're really looking at, you know, what are leadership characteristics that can be applied throughout the organization. Um, and so you all should be able to take away some ideas from today and start implementing them into your work where you are right now. It's not something in the distant future. Um, okay. So I'm curious if you could share in the chat, what are some common myths that we may hold about leadership? So a couple examples could be leaders are always on top, leaders are born, the loudest people in the room are the best leaders, somebody who's more senior in the team is a leader, leaders are extroverts. Maybe leadership is about results. Leaders control others. Their decisions are always the best. Woof, yeah. <laughs> Leaders have to be overtly dominant. No one complains, everyone must be happy. There's this magic leadership trait that some people have and others don't. What else? Leaders are tall. I think historically, a lot of male associated qualities are taken to be markers of leaders, totally. I think these are some great examples. Um, what I what I would like for you all to take away is that, oh, here we go, here's some more leaders must have their stuff together all the time. Wow, can you imagine if that was the case, that'd be a very stressful job. Leaders have all the answers. Yeah, leaders are never stressed. They're just so easygoing, chill, go with the flow, nothing wrong. So I like this idea of thinking as leadership as a personal approach instead of a positional approach. So it's how you interact with others and motivate others and um, share ideas, brainstorm, ideate, generate solutions that are tenants of good leadership. Um, but the people come first to leaders because to good leaders, because without people, who are you leading? We're not quite at the place where we have robots that are following us around like underlings, but uh, yeah, leaders never doubt 
these are all great, really great observations. Um, so what we're going to do next is we're going to spend some time in breakout rooms together. And I'd love for you all to discuss the article that Val sent out as pre-work. Um, here is a link to the article if you didn't have a chance to read it beforehand. It's pretty, um, pretty short, so I think you could skim and get caught up with the group. And then I have these instructions on a Google Sheet. Um, and I'm going to close these real quick, Val. Yeah, sorry. No worries. Um, oh, dang it. Let me give you access to that. Oh, okay. Okay, if you refresh the page, you should have access to it now. Um, and I'd like for you just to discuss these two questions. So are leadership skills critical to scientific research? And if so, why? And then in what ways have you seen good leadership make a difference in your area of research? And those can be examples from, um, from your current role or from grad school or wherever. Um, and we're gonna send you all in breakout rooms for about 15 minutes. Shall I go ahead and um, start creating them? Um, I think I've got you them can... ready to go. Okay. And I should have given you a more of a heads up, Val. I'm okay. sorry about that. Um, and you all will get a minute countdown when it's time to come back. And so once it says come back, you don't have to immediately hop back. You can finish your thoughts. Um, and then we'll debrief as a large group. Okay, any questions before we send you on your way? And because you're all newer into this cohort experience, I'd love for you to introduce yourself again and which LCPO you work in and maybe your job role. Chris? Uh, uh, Devin, so uh, are folks supposed to enter comments in the Google Doc or it's just a, it's just there for reference? It's just for instructions, yeah. Okay, right, so, okay, good. Okie dokes. Well, I will see you all back here. Oops, hold on. I wanna make sure we have enough people in every room. Okay, I'll see you all back here in about 15 minutes. Oops, and Patty is we didn't see Patty either. Okay, that's okay. She's okay. Thanks. Sorry, Devin. Um, I had talked to Paul about doing it, but I didn't talk to you about it. Okay. It's no worries. So, so when I when I did go in there, normally when I when I click recreate, it shows it puts up the names of everybody, and this time it didn't, which is why I did open rooms. Was that because you were also doing it? No, when you do recreate, you have to decide like how many rooms you want to open, and then mm -hmm. I always do assign participants instead of manually assign yeah. participants because if it's manually assigned, then you have to. Do it. Yeah. I don't know what was different. Like I, I did that earlier before, before we started any of this and that's what came up, but this time it didn't, um, it didn't, when I pressed recreate, it didn't, it just had the eight rooms, but no names. And hmm. it didn't ask me how many rooms or if I wanted to assign them this way or that way. Oh, well, I guess some kind of glitch in. Yeah. Zoom kind of changes around quite a bit too, with like what what everything looks like so do you think it makes a difference that that I'm not a host well you're a co-host too you're not a not a host hmm. it should be fine with co-host okay. permissions I don't know what happened okay hi Patty if you're there hi hi <laughs> Patty I was in the library yesterday and 
Um, I think, um, I'm just trying to remember, I saw some books, I saw a book that I don't know if, if, if it was, I can't remember now if it was your name that was on the sticky note, but it was on the pickup for hold, held books. And it was oh. called DEI Deconstructed. Is that, was that one that you had taken up? Um, or I, requested? That might've been um, a list from a book from a list that I asked the library to purchase. Oh yeah, it looked yeah. Like there were two of them. <laughs> yeah, oh, that's exciting. Um, yeah, because yeah, one of them, um, I remember I requested was a, a, a recently published book on analytics for DEI, measuring DEI. Oh, so I okay. hope that's one of them, maybe. This, yeah, this one from the little inside cover, it sounded like it was, among other things, I think talking about how how to do it badly, like what mm -hmm. what can go wrong. Mm -hmm. And um, so I actually, I was trying to use up some audible credits and I picked that one because mm -hmm. it sounded like it was read really well. So mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, very yeah. cool. Oh, I'm and, excited. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, it's, up, it's up there. It says for pickup in case you go to the Mesa Lab. It's um, okay. a white table kind of near the, well, middle yeah. of the entrance area. Oh, cool. I might go this Thursday um, after the, I'll be at the retreat in the morning on Thursday and maybe I'll just swing up oh, to the office. Okay. After. That's a good idea. Yeah. Yeah. I am trying to put together an um, evaluation textbook library uh, for our team. Oh. Yeah, so that oh, cool. if you like, you know, have a question about, you know, how do I do this or what's the method on, you know, how to do that, then there's a physical book you can check out. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Do you do you have an office now and where is it? No, oh. <laughs> I don't have one. No, I um I signed up for a cubicle actually um last week and Paula emailed me just to, today to say that. Uh, what I signed up for wasn't going to exist <laughs> in the future. <laughs> I thought it was kind of funny in a way and sad in a way. Um, no, I, not yet. I see. Okay. Yeah. Well, you know, the library incidentally has this really beautiful a counter bar that's got power that looks out the window mm -hmm. at the back of the library that is a potentially a good place to work. Yeah, I really enjoy being in the library. I find it really comfortable for me. Yeah, and, uh -huh. yeah it's just really um, like serene. Um, yeah, I'm it really is. happy. That That's that. a good word for it. It's yeah, like open and bright and yeah. simple, uncluttered, spacious. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And and then I was thinking about. I think you suggested a time to get together a date, and I I think March twenty second or something. And so I was gonna I was gonna. Sorry, I hadn't gotten back to you. Oh, you've been account. so busy. You've been so busy. No worries. You you can get email me whenever you can. Well, I do want to do that. So that would be nice. <laughs> yeah, I'm finally finally done with it, like literally like last night. I think. With this proposal for the REU network and yeah and to rewrite the proposal twice so I basically wrote three proposals because oh. the first time Rebecca I mean it needed it but Rebecca gave me feedback that it was it was too heavy on the DEI and not enough about what the basics are of what what the project does yeah and so I had to include that stuff <laughs> it's like oh yeah this is really the, a lot of the work here and then um so I rewrote it and then uh, when I was on vacation in big quotes um mm -hmm. Chris um Davis read it and he put a, one little comment he said this kind of reads like a list <laughs> mm -hmm. and it was and so I, I basically rewrote the whole thing again and so um I think it, I think it's pretty good now, but it was definitely, yeah, um, I'm really looking forward to not having that on my desk, on my plate. I bet. Yeah. Hi, Dan, Almost. Daniel. Hi, sorry, I'm a little late. How are you? Okay. So um, let's just see, I don't know if I can move you into a, oh yes, I, I'm going to move you um, into a, let's see, first I'm going to show you what the um, prompts are for the breakout group. 
Um, it's we're talking about leadership. So in the chat, there's a link. Um, and we were talking about qualities that um, people like in have in a leader and how does that manifest as a behavior. And then the prompts for the breakout groups, uh, which are about five minutes into a 10, a 15 minute time um, are in that Google doc. Um, do you see that? Can you access it? Yep, I see it. Thank you. Okay. So um, are you okay if I if I pop you into a room? So yeah, that should be good. Just pop me into one of the rooms and I can introduce okay. myself. All right. Thanks. There. Um, hey, Bill. Everything okay? It is. Thanks. Okay. As it turned out, um, Devin did the breakout groups. And when I was trying to do it before she did it, maybe she don't, but anyways, it didn't do the things that it had done earlier, like pop up and say, you know, do you, how many rooms do you want? Do you want this done manually? So I was getting confused. Like, I'm sorry. I, I, oh, it's not you. No, no, she. I in this other meeting and I. No, no, no. She, she see, I forgot to talk to her about it before we started. And so she actually was planning to do it. And then she, I don't know if she was, but anyway, so then she ended up doing it. Okay. <laughs> so all right. it's all good. All right. Hi, Patty. How are you? I'm good, Paul. How are you this morning? Good. good. All right. Well, let me know if you need anything. I'm, okay. I've got my ear in here. Okay. All right. Thanks. <laughs> He's the other Val. <laughs> um. Oh, I forgot that we're recording. Oh, I'll cut this out. Okay. <laughs> saw the red light. I'm glad you mentioned that because now I'll remember to um, yeah. edit that, edit this, and any other long um, breakouts. Um, so with, with this particular program, what, what are you thinking for evaluating, um, like for, yeah, for, for the evaluation piece? Yeah, I was thinking, um, of looking at the, the survey that, that we gave participants last year. And there's some questions that might not be applicable anymore because about the format, um, mm -hmm. And hopefully reusing a lot of the questions, but updating it to fit this um, this version. Okay. And I would um, it's on my list to get that in a Google Doc to share with you, Chris and Devin, um, okay. to get your ideas on how to um, new questions uh, to add to the survey, and then have that ready in time to submit to Human Subjects Committee. Okay. Yeah, and then I think um, I think it would also be nice to interview the organizers again to mm -hmm. ask, you know, how did it go this time? Um, you know, compared to last time, and you know, any further suggestions for right ways to improve as an organizer and things like that. Yeah, and it's different, really different, because we have this in-person four-day piece, which thankfully. Mm -hmm. Um, Scott and I have done these before, so it, I think, you know, if you hadn't, I think if we hadn't, it would be a lot because it's like, oh, yeah, we have to invite everybody to these, you know, Zoom, like give them the dates and times, things like that, the rooms. And, um, yeah, and we, I think we, we did try to design things in mm -hmm. a way that addressed interests and concerns of the last crew, last cohort. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, which I think is great. And um, yeah, I would love to ask the cohort questions about the in-person um, yeah. portion to see how that worked for them. Do you want to come to any of the events or the lunch? I mean, I should send you the agenda. Mm -hmm. um, and then yeah. if you want to go to lunches, um, if you tell us in advance, then like sort of soon I can tell Scott mm -hmm. um, 
how that you know because he's just counting people but you can go through the line at the cafeteria and um same for you Devin and have your lunch paid for you to say oh this is with the ECLP um but you know if you wanted to join and however I don't know if it's if it like can be informal informally interviewing if you sit with people at lunch to ask them questions can mm -hmm. you do that um I I might be able to do that I um, I mean sorry I meant like hypothetically not in terms of time is that like allowable as a as an evaluator um if um it is allowable um and I can put it as part of the protocol well no sorry I was just thinking um because it's next week it wouldn't it wouldn't be publishable data it would be for like her internal mm -hmm. um improvement part because mm -hmm. it, it wouldn't be part of the new ha um, protocol for human so subjects it could, but it could be you could use that information mm -hmm. to help you write the survey i could yeah okay that's cool yeah yeah and um i um might be able to join next week i just got scheduled for an outpatient procedure on oh. monday on Monday. Oh, okay. So um, I'm not quite sure how I'm going to feel. <laughs> yeah. I mean, outpatient today can include like kidney surgery. I mean, it's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I am getting stitches and I'm not sure how I'm going to feel. Oh, okay. oh, <laughs> I've never had stitches before. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, Hopefully it'll be not too long, too bad for the recovery. Yeah, yeah. I uh, I hope so too. Yeah. But I'll let you know. Um, okay. Is it okay if I let you know kind yeah. of short notice? You don't even, yeah, I mean, if you, if you can, great. But if you don't even let us know, just come. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to bring folks back. Okay. Sorry, I meant to give you a heads up and I, Sorry. I didn't. Welcome back. So you pop in there for a few seconds, Devin. I love an eavesdrop during a breakout <laughs> session. I should have given you a warning. Yeah, in real life, you know, you can see the person approaching, but in Zoom, you just pop <laughs> in. Surprise! Re, <laughs> Little horror film. Yeah, surprise facilitator. That could be a great horror film. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> And by the way, the breakout rooms don't get recorded at all. Like only the main room is recorded during the breakout rooms and then that gets cut from the video, edited from the video. Welcome back. Thank Hi. you for letting me, me eavesdrop. I should have given you a warning before I hopped in there. Um, so if it didn't startle anyone, but it sounded like you were having some great conversations. I didn't mean to interrupt you, Val. Did you have something you wanted to share? Oh, I wanted to see if I could um, take a quick screen screenshot of everybody um, who happens to be on screen number one. If you could turn on your camera and smile and um, just so as a little memento, um, <laughs> that would be great. Okay, I will tell you when. Okay, say cheese. And then let me see page two. I'll do it again. Second page of people. Thanks. Smile. Thank you. Sorry, Devin. <laughs> no worries. That's a fun memento to have. Um, so I'd love to hear how those conversations went and if you had any insights you feel comfortable sharing with the large group. We'll just hear from a few folks. Yeah, Monica. Yes, I'm happy to share initially um, on behalf of my group. And then if anybody wants to um, add um, to, I guess, my two main observations. One was that um, with respect to the first question, we thought, well, it was a little bit awkwardly um, uh, phrased because a lot of the people in our group um, don't do like basic scientific research. But then we thought, well, science, especially atmospheric science now, 
seems to be this like kind of multifaceted, highly collaborative endeavor. Um, and so kind of reconceptualizing um, the scientific space or landscape as that, then um, leadership skills do seem like they're critical because then you're managing across disciplines, across communities. Um, you need to be an effective um, communicator. Um, you need to also be able to negotiate and facilitate across different communities um, and different languages, things like that. Um, and so thinking about it in that way um, is important. And then with respect to the second question, one of the things that came out um, was that uh, there's a certain importance in having a leader that is willing to delegate, especially in those collaborative environments, to people who have the subject expertise and don't feel the necessity to, I guess you could say, micromanage everything. Um, and so having trust in your team members, being willing to delegate, and then that seems to, um, and Carlos brought this up, that seems to require that a person has a certain degree of confidence um, or high self-esteem that they're willing to admit that they might not be capable of tackling something and they need to delegate it out to somebody who's more of an expert. Um, I don't know if that characterizes everything that was discussed across our team members, but I'll, I'll let, we, I had Carlos, Ivana, um, and um, oh, I'm not seeing the other individual on the screen. Ivana anymore. gave a thumbs up. Okay, cool. Yeah, please. Yeah, in our group, we kind of had a similar conversation as Monica in that in this field, because it's become so multidisciplinary, it seems that you do need those leaderships, but there are fields that are still on their own doing just science in their own field. And there are people who are very successful there that don't necessarily need those leadership skills, but not having those skills is impacting the team members. It's not that it's not affecting anyone and they're able to do their science, but it's at the cost of people not feeling good about what they're doing, losing their self-confidence or not, you know, being led properly. I don't know if the other team members wanted to add to that that were in my group that we talked about. Yeah, and, and I was thinking there was something else we discussed about as part of that was noticing oftentimes maybe like a generational differences on how that's treated um, that came up quite a bit. Thank you. And, you know, I hear kind of a little bit of like a chicken versus egg problem, right? Of people need to have some level of expertise to get into these leadership type roles so that they understand the problem, right? And if they're lacking some of those interpersonal skills, it's going to create more work for everyone, right? If we have high performing teams and lots of trust and direction and clear expectations and help for each other, then it's easier to focus on what the problem is, right? But if we have kind of the opposite of that, where there's a lot of conflict and it's not about something work-related, but it's interpersonal and people are undermining each other, then it's really hard to focus on the problem because the problem has become the team, right? Other observations? Yeah, Dong. Hi, this is Dong from uh, Room 5. We have Bert, Timothy, uh, Samaya, and myself. Uh, we have discussed something similar to what uh, uh, other folks just mentioned, but uh, um, another topic is that uh, um, with a good leadership, um, we can organize like a large group of people to achieve goals that can never be achieved by a small group of people. So I, I, we think this is um, especially important in nowadays when we are encountering all kinds of challenges, especially that needs like as a global efforts to address. So just to add up to that. Totally kind of the sum is greater than the parts philosophy. And that's becoming exceptionally true in atmospheric science, right? It's so dis interdisciplinary and it's just gonna continue to be more so that way. Tracy? Yeah, this is more for question two, but our, I, maybe related to question two, but our group discussed a lot about um, how, how a good leader also wants to 
uh, help you grow. They want you to succeed and they'll push people towards something, a common goal. And they need to know or they need to understand um, each of the team members and what they want to achieve as well. So that was more towards um, number two. Yeah, that kind of formal or informal sponsorship and mentorship that leaders can provide. Does anyone have an example they want to share from question two? Okay, I'm not going to drag it out of you. <laughs> Although sometimes I will. <laughs> um, I'm going to start sharing my screen again. And um, we're going to go on a break in just a second, but I do want to talk through this skills required for management success. And this is really for supervisors, but I think we can easily apply it to any leadership role and is kind of driving home the point that we've had. I think that's been over all of this conversation from Val's question initially of how important are technical skills to leadership and vice versa. And so I really like this model. Um, so let's talk through this. So the first level we have is this individual contributor, which would be, I think, most of the folks in this room where you're not supervising anyone. And you may have some leadership roles in projects, but you're not formally supervising anyone else. And the majority of your time when you're an individual contributor is spent in technical work with a little bit of interpersonal work when you're working with your colleagues or collaborating. But, but a good chunk of it is technical expertise. The next would be supervisory management. So this would be someone who supervises a team, but does not supervise other supervisors, if that makes sense. So it's just the first level supervisor. And they spend time, about half their time in technical, you know, about half their time in interpersonal, and they just start to dip into this strategic visioning of where are we going, but for the most part are still implementing ideas that have been decided at a higher level and are spending a lot of time working on team cohesion and making sure that the technical aspect of things are moving forward, right? The next level is middle management. So these would be supervisors of supervisors. And these folks spent most of their time in interpersonal management. So they're looking at how the team's functioning, helping address any problems, helping remove obstacles and barriers, which sometimes we don't think of as being interpersonal, but a lot of times it is. A little bit of time in technical, right? There's, they still have some of that expertise and a good chunk of time in strategic visioning and planning and thinking about where we're going in the next five months, six years, 60 years. And then finally, we have executive management. So for this, we're thinking like, lab directors and up, um, where they spend very little time, I think, unfortunately, for a lot of our great minds that we have at this level on the technical research aspect. It might be projects that they're super interested in or, um, you know, just attending conferences and staying up to date and learning about what their lab is researching. But it's the bulk of their time is spent in interpersonal relationships and strategic and this is not like a one size fits all. There may be some lab directors who spend way more time in technical. And this is a model that's used across all types of disciplines and workforces. And so, um, you know, this will be applied differently depending on who it is. Um, but I'm curious, have you seen this in your own work? Yeah. And how many of you have kind of noticed that shift if you've served in any type of leadership capacity from technical to interpersonal heavy? Any observations or 
anecdotes about this? Yeah, Timothy. Yeah, I guess maybe more of a question. I don't know, but um, you know, once kind of we start proposal writing, that sort of I feel gets into the strategic area to some extent. Um, and so maybe you're not necessarily managing people yet. So you may be in the individual contributor category, but you are, you know, leading your own proposals or contributing to proposals and kind of do have a say somewhat in the strategic category. So just a just a thought. I don't know. I don't know if it was a question or a thought. I'm not sure, but just something to to ponder there. Well, I think a lot of the nature of the science we're doing here is is future focused as well, right? So there has to be strategy in in all of this. So that's a good point. Maybe for you, Car, we drag this yellow line so so that it hits down here uh, just a little bit on the individual contributor because there is some strategic work going on there. Any other thoughts? Yeah, Shelby. Sorry. Um, yeah, so when I I decided to start helping out with ESD, um, at the help desk over in UCAR, um, I found that it it wasn't necessarily that they didn't have like a, a lack of technical knowledge. Um, they they really just needed a leader or like a guide <laughs> to help them in the right place or to the right places. So <clears throat> uh, I quickly found that like me just coming in with my technical knowledge wasn't wasn't necessarily what they needed, and that kind of set my uh, my sights on like, oh, I need to learn how to how to manage and how to lead. Um, so it was a really interesting shift that I saw when I was like, oh, I this is a kind of a different skill set that I need, really, besides technical. Um, and that's kind of why I'm here, honestly. <laughs> I love that. And I think that's a need that's been identified at our organization. We have a new supervisor training called Lead that my office puts on. And we always, we tell them you're supposed to spend like anywhere from 30 to 50% of your time supervising. And that could be removing obstacles. It could be one-on-ones. It could be collaborating with your direct report. It could be managing conflict. Like it's not just all one-on-one -on -one meetings. And people are always like, whoa, that is so much time. And it is, but that is kind of what happens as you move further up the chain, as you spend a lot of time um, managing other people and a lot less time in the technical skills. Any other thoughts? Yeah, Heather? Yeah, so um, are we at all in this course going to talk about the transitions between these levels? Um, and I mostly bring this up because in the past I've had supervisors that um, they were promoted because they really excelled technically, um, but they didn't necessarily meet all the skills needed for uh, on the interpersonal side of things to be as effective as possible. Um, and so I'm curious if we're going to talk about how to address those uh, potential deficits as you move up through these different levels of management. So we won't be explicitly talking about the step to supervisor that would be in the lead program, but I will say based on Heather's comment, that's kind of a challenge I have for you all is to think about why are these skills important and how would these be important in your next level career step um, of how could these use you, how could you use these skills to support your team at an individual contributor level and how might you use them differently at a supervisory level or a team lead level? I think that's a great, um, I'm going to challenge you all to, to kind of keep that in the back of your mind. Okay, well, we are coming up right on the hour, and I would love to give folks the opportunity. Oh, Chris, I'd love to hear from you before I give folks the opportunity to water balance. Just, just to amplify a bit on, on Heather's uh, comment uh, that, you know, next week, a lot of what we're going to be doing is really connected to this interpersonal space. And so for all of you, 
I think this is a really great opportunity um, to do, if you haven't had a, a lot of training in, uh, in this in this area to to really think about some of these issues because this there's a reason why it's such a concentrated effort next week because it is such a huge aspect of of leadership and so you may not see exactly the topic all you know i mean i think there are a lot of topics and we're, we're trying to cover a lot of ground here but just that emphasis means that this is this is really important so at least you can have that perspective hey yeah how do we translate it to everybody else maybe who's at maybe has not had the benefit of going through this training or a similar training i think that is a really good question for the organization because that blue bar in the middle is really critical to all these levels. Thanks. Thanks, Chris. Um, so I'll say this video, it will keep you sitting here because it's really fun. So if you need to use the restroom or get more water, I'd say get up before I press play because otherwise you will be sitting in your seat. Um, but let's take about five minutes and when we return, um, we'll hop into uh, some leadership styles. Welcome back. If you can give me either like a thumbs up or turn your camera back on so I know that you're here. And I'm sorry if you didn't get a water balancing break because you were captivated by <laughs> that video. I don't I want to know how I can get um get working a hydraulic press to be part of my job description in HR. So if you have any ideas, I'd love to do a quick brainstorm session on that. <laughs> Okie dokes. So I think most folks are back. So we're gonna go ahead and move on. Um, and so we're going to transition into uh, talking about different types of power. And I'll, I'll start this off by saying that there's there's not a one size fits all approach to leadership. And some of these will feel more natural to you than others. I think it's good to take note of which of these you're like, yeah, I could totally see myself doing that. And which ones you're like, yick, who would lead like that? Why would anyone do that? Um, because there will be times in any type of role where you need to pull out all the tools in your tool belt, even the ones that feel like using your non-dominant hand to tighten a screw with, right? And so uh, just just take note of those um, and kind of what like these different flavors of leadership look like. Um, okay, so the first type of power that we see is coercive power. So this is when we're forcing someone to do something against their will or imposing consequences. Um, and so this most times can lead to fear, dissatisfaction, resentment, and this is the least effective type of power. But can you think of an opportunity where this might be necessary? So this, this sort of thing might only really be necessary in the most extreme of circumstances. So say you have a member of your team belittling um, another member of your team, you know, some of that coercive power, you know, after trying everything else, you say, hey, this needs to be a discussion with HR. This is not acceptable behavior. And so coercive power is only really good when at least in the workplace, when someone's overstepped all the boundaries and you kind of have to lay down the rules and say, this is not, we don't do this here. We don't belittle other coworkers. We don't create unsafe, uncollaborative environments. Uh, thanks, Heather. Um, Dong, I see you have your hand up as well. Yeah, I think this can be sometimes necessary and uh, helpful um, when someone like get uh, distracted rather than working really toward the final goal. So sometimes, for example, by putting a uh, deadline, kind of a coercive, that's kind of helpful to uh, prevent people from being distracted. Yeah, and I think we'll look through some of these other options where a deadline could fit in. I think what I think of for coercive power is like safety issues, right? If someone's about to get hurt, then you do need to be really firm and say, don't do that, right? I think it's a great some great examples here of Sometimes you do need to be a little bit more direct with feedback. I see Samia in the chat said with kids and Monica said perhaps when dealing with antagonistic team members, this is required. 
Right. And so I would say because this is the least effective type of power you can use, this isn't something that you want at the top of your tool belt because it's just going to make people resent you, right? If you're just flexing that power muscle all the time, do what I say, do what I say, do what I say. Number one, your biceps is going to get really sore. Number two, people are going to stop listening to you saying, do what I say, do what I say, do what I say, because you say that all the time. Um, the next type of power is reward. And so this you can think of as giving something of value in return of a request. Um, and so this can have mixed results um, and can still be a least, what the second least effective method. So this would be, um, you know, if you get that paper written, then I will let you do the early career leadership program, right? Those two things aren't necessarily equal or interrelated. And that can also drive some resentment for folks, but it could be, you know, you have to get this X amount of funding brought in, or you have to finish this project before we can do that, where it can be more effective, but we have better approaches. Um, any questions or ideas of when reward might be an effective type of power? Oh, I see Monica in the situation where there's no momentum for a project or a team is strongly lacking in motivation. Okay, let's move on to the third, which is legitimate. So this is based on a role or position. And so this power stays with the position, not the person. So, you know, if Chris is my supervisor, he would have that legitimate power. But if I changed roles or Chris changed roles, he would no longer have that legitimate power, right? Because it's it's positional. Um, and so the... Ability to persuade others is weak on its own, just based on the position, um, but it can be a foundation for what we're going to talk about in the next three layers of power. Um, does that make sense to everyone? Awesome. Any questions so far? Also awesome. Okay, the fourth type of power is referent. Um, and so this is uh, respect or, or having similar values, uh, being charismatic, um, and this can garner loyalty. And I think a lot of times we think of this as like some people have it um, and others don't, but this is something that you can cultivate. So this is, uh, you know, working on your rapport building skills, um, a lot of that emotional intelligence we were talking about um, to where people have this sense that they want to follow what you're doing. I think it's easy to think of political leaders in this kind of lens where, um, you know, people just believe in their good intent if they agree with them, believe in their bad intent if they disagree with them. Um, can anyone think of examples of when this might be an effective power type? So for me, I think of like change management. Um, whenever we have some new initiative coming down, uh, kind of getting buy-in and really painting the picture for what it's going to look like. Um, you know, I think of with the big REM project, this is what the future of work is going to look like at UCAR. And getting buy-in is not always easy, right? And so having some of that charisma and positivity and painting the picture is really important in those types of situations. Um, the next type of power is informational power. So this is having knowledge that others don't um, and maybe the ability um, for that information to affect change. And so this can be used to measure and improve tasks, um, processes, or strategies. and um, this is one of the best types of power if used well, but we don't want to be a gatekeeper necessarily, right? That can breed distrust and resentment, but sharing that knowledge, kind of the sponsorship and mentorship we were talking about earlier, can be a really great way to get buy-in from staff. Can you think of, of an example when this has worked uh, maybe in your role or you've seen a supervisor 
hire use it? Oh, we need to do some stretches after that break. Y'all are quiet. Okay, I see Chris, and then we'll go to Timothy. Tim, why don't you go ahead? Okay, thanks, Chris. Um, I, I don't know uh, if, if this is a good example, but maybe if like a group of researchers is discussing uh, potential methods to achieve some task, um, and there's kind of maybe two potential paths forward and, and one person perhaps has more experience or more information about the topic and they believe that their method is kind of a better path forward. Is that an example of this? I, I don't know. Yeah, I think that's really close. I would say that informational would be maybe they've, you know, you're trying to get a grant for a project and this person has successfully received a grant from the granting organization previously and they know that they're going to want, you know, three types of information in the proposal. And you wouldn't know that unless you'd been rejected or approved for a grant before. And so they're able to inform the group of like, actually, this is gonna give us a better chance of getting that. Um, but I I think that's like the next level of informational. I think yours would be just a touch okay. below that, but, but great insights, yeah. Tim. Oh, thanks. Chris. Devin, I wanted to point out a, a challenge with informational power in that uh, there is often, especially at different levels of leadership, certain information that for whatever reason, often it's policy, sometimes it's legal, sometimes it's uh, just, uh, I don't know, I think, and that's a judgment call sometimes that isn't shared and and, and really can't be shared and this is a challenge because that's definitely information that people don't have and they're not there's a decision that they won't have it and so how as a leader do you balance that with the problem of you know undermining trust because that's what tends to happen if there's a lot of that information that isn't shared so i i think this is a really delicate uh situation that that often comes up yeah, and I, I think having kind of that base level trust is important and being clear and explicit where you're able to be clear and explicit. So sharing freely when you're able to, and then explaining to staff why you're not able to share at that time, right? Like it's above me, I'm not part of that decision, or um, I'm not allowed, I, I can't share this information with you yet, but I want you to be prepared, you know, of giving folks, if you can't give them the what at least give them some of the why, but that can also be a fine line with uh, like legal issues or employee personnel issues. Um, I think that's something that is really situational um, and it, it can be challenging, right? Because you may know we can't do that because we're gonna have to cut half the positions in this group or something, right? Like we can't commit to this project because we're not gonna have the staff, but that hasn't become public knowledge yet. So how do you share that, right? You have that informational power and you do have to be a little bit secretive about it. It's, it's a real challenge for leaders. And I think if you're in that position, being really clear with whoever's giving you that information, what you are and aren't allowed to share with your team at this time um, gives you kind of a clear bumpers. Any other? Yeah, Tracy. Yeah, I was just going to say another challenge with um, imparting your knowledge or your information onto another is just the time constraint. Um, sharing all of your knowledge and stuff can often be very time consuming. You can't always do that, but you can at least give them guidance and pathways and let them kind of gain some of that information. Sometimes it's just getting your hands wet or your feet wet to really learn something. So, um, so it's, it's not maybe imparting all of your knowledge, but at least providing some pathways for it too. So just because of that challenge of having the time to do it. Totally. And I think in my work, that's one of our biggest uh, risks right now is how do we 
we have a bunch of people who are retiring soon or are of retirement age at our organization. And how do we transfer that rich knowledge and understanding that they have without making it burdensome and asking them to, you know, basically type up an entire life's essay of this is everything I know and this is everything I've learned. It's it's a great point, Tracy. Val? Yeah, there's um, another kind of knowledge um, that I notice that my uh, one of my bosses has shared with me over the, over the years, informational that is, um, which is uh, keeping me up to date on sort of what's going on in the organization. And, um, you know, maybe that's some big movement, like, you know, one of the, like REM or SAM, I don't actually know about them very much, but um, so that you, you're not in the dark and that you, you start to understand how the organization works. Um, so for instance, um, the two people that have supervised me in the last few years Chris and Rebecca have been on the executive committee for NCAR directorate and just getting, getting information that way. And, and sometimes we're shocked to find out that people in other labs don't know about some of the things that are going on. And it's because those leaders, those lab directors maybe didn't share that information with people. So it's less content or technical in a sense, less technically, you know, technical information, but more organizational. And, and I find that very, very helpful because learning how the organization, wherever you are, operates is really good knowledge to have. Yep. And I think this can go both directions, right? Um, individual contributors can have a lot of in information that's powerful, just in the same way that senior leaders do, um, of understanding you know, their positionality in the organization. Okay, I do want to move on to the final type of power, which is expert power. So this is related to informational, but this is more in those kind of technical skills instead of the interpersonal side of information. And so this is having knowledge, skills, and experience that others don't. Um, so these two are really, I think, kind of hard to pull apart, especially in an organization like ours. Um, but this is oftentimes the most effective type of power. I think if you think about a great supervisor or a great person you've worked with um, in the past, sorry, someone's trying to hop into my office. <laughs> um, it's easy to think about how perhaps they've shared some of this expert knowledge with you of like, oh, I have a contact there. Oh, you really want to consider this. This might be a misstep. Have you considered this type of model? Um, does that make sense to everyone? Okay, and I see in the chat along those lines, sharing opportunities 100% for both informational and expert, right? Once you're at that expert level knowledge, um, opportunities are likely to come knocking. And so thinking about where you can share, share the love. Okay, and now I wanna talk about different leadership types. And so we just talked about power, which is something that everyone can use at different parts of their career, all parts of their career, and in different situations. Um, this is more of like a leadership philosophy. And so the first type of leadership style uh, I want to talk about is results leaders. So uh, that's just what it sounds like. And so someone who is really focused on the end goal, um, and it might be a project manager or someone who knows where uh, where we want to get to, and also knows how we need to get there. Um, and really, the intent is on helping others get to the results. Um, and so that's results type leaders. The next is process. And so these folks are really good at setting up systems and structures or like processes <laughs> um, and flow charts so you know how to get from A to B. And so they don't necessarily focus on the end goal. Um, but instead they're focused on how are we getting to the end goal? So A, B, C, D, E, F, G, et cetera, not just A to Z. Does that make sense? Okay. The third is thought. And so these are people who have the ideas, um, they're futurists or visionaries, um, and are they're good at getting people um, kind of bought in on, on what they see, their thoughts or their ideas. Um, and so that might be something like, let's explore geoengineering and see where we can go with this. Um, 
And a lot of times people are drawn to this because they're the big picture thinkers and can say like, this is the future. We have data leaders who are really good at crunching numbers, analyzing, reporting, visualizing. Um, they're an expert on interpreting data. Social leaders, and then I'm gonna put people leaders because I wanna differentiate these two. So social leaders I think of as out and wide. So these are your natural networkers. Um, they have like 1500 connections on LinkedIn. They know everyone. You like hang out with them at a conference and it's like, whoa, like, how did you possibly meet all these people and know all this information about their grandmothers, right? So these people are really out and wide. Um, and they are a great person to, to find resources for others because of their connection where people leaders are kind of down and deep. So um, this is focusing on developing others, understanding their needs. Uh, this will look like coaching or mentoring or training and really diving into that on the one-on-one -on -one level. Um, and I think being aware of yourself can help you navigate situations. And so um, I'd be curious, are you all familiar with the annotate feature in Zoom? Um, so on your menu, there should be a button that you can click that says annotate. And you can choose a stamp, you could choose like a star or a heart. And I would love for you to place a stamp on the type of leader that most resonates with you. We see in the chat lower left. And yes, you can you can have multiple leadership styles. See lots of process, some social and people, data. Thought. So this is what I was talking about at the beginning of our session. If any of these feel super icky to you where you're like, I don't think I could ever be that type of leader, it's good to have that awareness because you want to make sure that you are connected to people who are that type of leader, right? Who can fill in for you, perhaps in those types of things. We don't need to be all rounded, but you do need to be aware of when these might be helpful hats to wear. Can't find the stamp. If you are on the web app, you may not have the annotate feature, which is not a big deal. Um, ah. It is not recently enabled, but if you're not using the desktop client, it won't work on the web app. And I don't know why they had it fixed for a while and I guess they've unfixed it. Um, great, well, thank you. I also love these little stars up here on the social. That's a very social approach to stamps. And then uh, the final thing I wanna say about this before we move on is that um, you're not using these as labels necessarily, but rather self-awareness. So if you aren't inclined to developing processes, if that's a requirement of your job, or if you get in a space where you need to do that, that's something to kind of be like a little yellow flag in your head, right? Of like, ooh, that's not my preferred type of leadership. So I'm gonna have to be really aware of that as we approach this project. Okay, I'm gonna clear, yeah, delegation opportunity. Exactly, Chris, you've got it. Um, I'm gonna clear our drawings. Actually, yes, I do have to clear them. I'll save this though, if we wanna look at that later. Um, thank you for, for joining me in that. Um, okay, so next we're gonna move on to uh, another exercise in Padlet, which is a little different than Jamboard, but I like this because we're able to upvote what other people say. And I would love for you, 
um, over the next, I'm gonna say five minutes. So it's gonna be quick, five, six minutes um, to add sticky notes to each uh, column. Let me pull this up. It'll be easier for me to explain it if I can show you. Um, so you can add a sticky note for and write um, either qualities, behaviors, and skills you might see in this type of leader. So exactly, process leader could be detail-oriented. Social leader could be, um, you know, networker. And then if you see something that you like, go ahead and add a heart to it. And we're going to spend, like I said, the next five or so minutes until 10.35 or 35 after adding these points. Um, any questions? I know I didn't do a really great job. Explaining. <laughs> okay. I see folks adding away. So I'm going to play some music again.
Okay, so we're going to transition to another breakout room and Val, I've got them ready to go. Um, in the chat, you'll find another breakout room prompt. And what I'd like for you to do, you're gonna be in groups of about four or five, is to discuss which leadership style most resonates with you um, and how might your preferred style contribute to scientific research excellence. Um, and then if each group could choose a reporter, that would be great. We're not gonna be able to hear from every group, but uh, to have someone prepared to share out to the main group. And if no one wants to be the reporter, the reporter will be the person who last ate pizza. And I'm always looking for recommendations. So that's that's a great way to choose a reporter. Um, does anyone have any questions before I send you on your way? This is a quick breakout room. You're gonna have about 10 minutes. Seeing none, hearing none, I will send you on your way. Okay, sorry to pull us away from that exciting topic because I'm interested in that as well, but I do want to make sure we have time to reflect on any takeaways you may have from your breakout room. So our group um, talked a lot about the different, you know, how hard it is to sometimes choose one leadership style. Um, mm -hmm. And we kind of touched on how sort of being a leader, a chameleon like leader can be very useful. Um, sometimes not having a clear leadership style is seen as a negative, but we kind of discussed it as a positive of you can adapt to various situations. You can read the room, you can see, okay, is this group on this project, are they process oriented? Are they detail oriented? Are they big picture? You know, what needs aren't being met for this project and can I fill that? Um, and that was per particularly useful for some of us. Um, and, and that would contribute to like our research excellence by filling in niches rather than just having there be a hole in like the skill sets or in leadership skill sets in our group. Yeah, I love that. And these aren't mutually exclusive. So you can have multiple types that you're using at any given time. And I love that approach of thinking what type of leader does the group need at this time. Um, that's great. Katie? Yeah, so some of the types that resonated with our group, I think we were all kind of on the same page. So we talked about process, social, uh, and the sort of distinction between social and people resonating, appreciating that there's a distinction between the one-on-one -on -one interactions versus like being in, being in the network or having a lot of networking ability. Um, so we talked about how, you know, process is sort of fundamental to scientific research. And then a, a, coupled to that is also the data type. So we talked about that a little bit about how that's kind of underlying scientific research, and it's not always the most exciting thing to do to maintain data or document or, you know, promote open science practices, but it's really uh, sort of fundamental. And um, we also sort of touched on the, the cultural aspects of, of that. Thank you. Yeah, and these are dynamic as well, right? So they're playing on each other. So if you find yourself naturally in kind of a social leader space, say social and data leader, those two being heavily inclined towards the social leadership will impact how you approach data leadership, right? And vice versa. Like maybe you love a personal CRM, keep track of everyone you've met at a conference. Business cards are your besties. Other questions or observations, not questions, Tim? Yeah, so our group, uh, was kind of almost split into two camps. Uh, one was more kind of social based and the other one was more um, process based. Um, but I think everyone agreed that, um, especially when it comes to like meetings and keeping the group on track, that having more of like a thought um, approach, kind of big picture approach and, and understanding how kind of everyone is fitting in, in the overall goals is really helpful um, to keep everybody on track. Um, and if you want a pizza recommendation, I can recommend uh, Via Toscana in Louisville is really good. 
I have been there in the summer. They have great food. Thank you. Yes. I would, yeah. I endorse that as well. <laughs> <laughs> Jerry. Thanks, Devin. Yeah, in our group, we talked about how um, different leadership styles arise and grow depending on the position that you are in in the organization. Um, and um, some of the participants in the group that are more on the science side um, identified more with the data leadership or or um, or process leadership styles. Um, and there were others in, in the group, and, and I can talk to, to my perspective, um, as a student program co coordinator, that the people leadership style is one that I rely on more. I also come from a background of hospitality, and so that was built in that time, and it, I think it helps me be a, an effective program coordinator. Um, we also just wanted to say that, um, you know, obviously not everyone within this group, although we work at NCAR and, uh, you know, work in atmospheric science and our system science, <clears throat> that, could, you know, may have a, some background in, in science or research, um, but those that work in education and outreach or IT and others, many of these questions are posed through the lens of scientific research, and we're trying to come at it from a broader perspective or from the perspective of our positions. Thank you for that feedback, Jerry. Okay, we are going to have to wrap up because we're right at the edge of time and I do wanna give Chris and Val the opportunity to discuss what's gonna happen next week. Um, be, but before I pass the mic over to them, uh, I would love for you, if you're comfortable to share answers to these questions in the chat. So the first is how has your view of leadership changed or has your view of leadership changed? And if so, how? And the next is in what ways could you apply your preferred leadership style in your current environment? Um, and so uh, maybe just take one minute. You don't have to give super explicit details. I'm not looking for a smart goal, just some reflection. See some great responses in the chat, just a little less than one minute. And if you don't answer in the chat, at least answer in your head, okay? <laughs> Okay, it looks like there's a lull. So Chris and Val, I'd love to pass it over to you. And thank you all. I really enjoyed our time together. I'm looking forward to meeting you in real life next week. Yeah, thank you so much, Devin. That was really excellent. Um, it's, it's such a vague term, leadership, and a, in, you know, it's kind of a catch-all, but it's great to have you break down a lot of these things. So thank you. Um, so um, yeah, so this is our um, last time seeing you virtually before we meet up in person um, next Monday. And um, so about six people, I think, are, are coming into town from, from somewhere else. And hopefully well, let us know if you need any additional help with travel or anything. But um, yeah, so we'll see you on Monday morning. One thing that we um, we, I will send out a, a more detailed agenda later today um, to give you more information about where we'll be exactly, which it'll be, everything will be at the NCAR Mesa lab. 
And the only change really is that, um, and if you really can't do this, don't worry, but is that we're asking you to, to be there at 8.45 instead of nine. Um, and we will have coffee there in the morning. Um, you will have lunch provided through the cafeteria, through the line, um, and, um, and then we will wrap up by three uh, on each day. So we have some really terrific um, guest speakers and facilitators, uh, and we'll be working somewhat in um, a few different spaces, um, but uh, largely in the NCAR library, which has been renovated and is very spacious and serene. Um, as well as uh, the Damon room, I think, or maybe it's just the main seminar room. Um, in any case, um, one of the things um, that I would like to do is just offer that, uh, to, um, that um, I think Will and I are going to put together a, a, a little sign-up sheet for if you're interested in going out for dinner together with others um, on, let's say, Monday and Tuesday nights, especially if you're from out of town. Um, is we'll, we'll put up a couple of uh, types of food thematic, thematically, um, and then um, you can organize that, that way, like if you love Indian food or, or something like that. Um, and then that's on your own dime, but um, it just, it's really nice to be able to get together like that. Um, Chris, do you have anything to add? Uh, Val, I was gonna just, make sure we all get in the in the right place on on Monday first thing are we saying that we're meeting kind of by the coffee oh. which is going to be the outer Damon room that's right? right yes that's right thank you yeah so we'll meet in the outer Damon room of the Mesa lab which is upstairs and you know hopefully you'll, you'll know where it is but if you don't just ask ask around uh, it's up it's upstairs from the main entry um, of the NCAR Mesa lab and is the first session in the main seminar room? I think it is. I'll, I'll, I'll double check, but I think so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, and everything next week will be at the Mesa Lab. So we, we noticed, uh, we, we were commenting on the fact that if you if you haven't been to the Mesa Lab or, or you go there very infrequently, it takes a while <laughs> to get from the parking lot into the building. So allow that few minutes of extra time uh, for that. And uh, lunch is, uh, as I understand, you just have to say early career leadership program when you get to the cashier so that they know to put it on that uh, account. And uh, these are gonna be uh, not really working lunches. They're gonna just, we hope that you'll kind of gather with each other and have lunch together. Uh, but you know, you don't have to talk about you can talk about anything you want. Uh, it's not, it's not required. <laughs> so. Right. Yeah. Thanks. And um, Devin uh, put some instructions to the Devin to the uh, Damon room in the chat. Um, so that's that's all we have. Um, if you have any questions and you want to stay on the line, I can stay on for a few minutes. Uh, but otherwise, um, please take good care of yourselves this week and. We'll be happy to see you in person on Monday. And thanks again, Devin. Um, Katie, no, sorry, I didn't say that. Tracy. Tracy. Oh, Katie. Tracy, go ahead. Yeah, I just, you you mentioned it takes a while to get from the parking lot. Um, how long? Oh, it, it no, it's forever. We, we were joking like about it. it. Oh. It, it, it's like an extra, it's like a five minute. It just, I've, I've been, I've been on the verge of being late a lot of times and so that extra few minutes seems to matter <laughs> yeah it's it's just different from you know most places you go when you arrive in the parking lot you feel like time-wise you're pretty much there but it's it's a little bit of a little bit of an uphill walk <laughs> good exercise with some stairs <laughs> gotcha okay i see what you mean <laughs> and then it's windy sometimes too so yeah yeah and was there was somebody else had a question, but I guess their hand is down.